afternoon. Welcome back. We are here at Lina Pelle with uh, you know, the second talk of today that has been guided by the first one uh, where we talk about responsible innovation. Responsible innovation is very important to all of us, but we need also a responsible finance. You know? We said that we face a new generation of responsible fibers, but what does it mean? We are going to evaluate new responsible finance strategies and tools. And uh, you know, today we have uh, a very you know, different kind of expression of the role of uh, responsible finance uh, that is so important because when you need to face uh, you know, this new challenge, if you do not have tools to get there, and I'm looking at you also, Christian, because you are also one of our first speakers, I think without that, it's very, very difficult you know, to get on. So let's move to Christian Layol, head of UK, uh, the Mills Fabrica. Welcome. Uh, Christian is head of the Mills UK Fabrica, an innovation platform supporting startup and driving a more sustainable future for the food and fashion industries. So it's founded in Hong Kong in 2018. But I think it will be good to hear from you because uh, you are here to talk about responsible finance from two different point of view. You know, the one of innovation and the one also of supporting the new generation of people that is going to work in this field. Uh, Christian, can you take us through, you know, first of all, who you are and what you do, and then a little bit introducing your system? Thank you, Juicy. A pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, so the Mills Fabrica is a platform that focuses both on creating the conditions to help startups that are working towards innovation, sustainable innovation, um, get those innovations to go up to scale, as Dan was saying earlier yeah. on, because if those innovations stay in a lab or stay in a school, they don't really have much of an impact. So we try and help them by connecting them to corporates, manufacturers, we're working with schools, um, to really connect the dots of the supply chain, as it were. And concurrently, we have an investment fund that allows us to invest in the startup. So we invested in Bolt Threads, for example. Um, and, uh, and these are uh, capital investments that allow these startups to have the money to build a team, to build a factory, to take it to the next level. So um, VCs... There's a, there's a lot of impact VCs now that we're seeing. Uh, we're yeah. not the only ones that are interested in investing in startups coming up with sustainable innovations. Uh, but we are focused on only investing in sustainable innovations because that is clear that that's what the future is going to hold. And I think any company that isn't investing in sustainability in one form or another, whether it's reducing energy waste or improving water, uh, usage, uh, will be in big trouble. Um, we've seen big banks like BlackRock announce that they will no Absolutely. longer be uh, doing investments unless there's sustainability. And I think it's going to be the same thing for an insurance company looking at a company. Maybe they won't insure you if you don't have a it's proper a risk ESG assessment. framework. Uh, Correct. Absolutely. Correct. Yeah. No, it's, this is really important. We are hearing Davos, you know, the last at least uh, four edition where there is no money invested if there is not sustainability behind, you know, for the reason that we talk. So, uh, which are the criteria, you know, because a selection of these, uh, you know, new realities, how, because there are so many and uh, as someone was saying in the panel before, there is a lot of confusion, you know, because there are announcements every day and we know why. <laughs> but how? How? It's, <laughs> it's very hard. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot of companies working on alternative leathers, right? Alternative materials. There's new fibers. There's new ways of dyeing. I think what we look for is, you know, first of all, the team, the founders, the background, the passion behind it. The idea uh, doesn't really matter unless you have a team that can execute it, right? So we look quite closely at the team. We also look at uh, benchmarks. So if we know that, for instance, there's a mushroom leather that has this performance, that is comparable to animal leather, then we start comparing it towards that benchmark and see how the others are doing. Um, there's um, a lot of research that goes into it. We need to be able to make uh, sound investment decisions that will eventually pay off for us. But also to be sure, 
there will be mistakes. You know, I think investors say if you're investing in four good companies out of 10, then that's a good ratio. So that means six might fail. Um, but we're, we're um, focusing specifically in a space that's less crowded. I think there's a lot of interest at the moment in circular secondhand marketplaces and e-commerce. That's very crowded and, and it's going to be very quickly um, I think dominated by a few players, right? You that's already have Vestiaire Collective and the Real Real, and so that's yeah. very hard to enter that market. What we're looking at is earlier on in the supply chain. So with new material innovations, um, this could be the w even the way that cotton is being grown. We're looking at hydroponics. We're looking at new systems that allow for more efficient growth that use less land, less water. And then we look at the whole supply chain. So is, is there a better way of dyeing leather or dyeing garments that has less chemicals? So, um, so that's the sort of the journey that, that we're looking at. And, it, and it's quite exciting. And as I was telling you earlier, we're also comparing it to the food industry, which is doing some amazing things, especially in um, traceability and transparency in blockchain, from which the fashion industry can learn from. So uh, that's just a bit of a recap in terms of where our focus is. And that's what we're waiting for, really, to have someone that has already done some experiences and try to, you know, copy something that is the best practice. But this means that you have amazing teams uh, of experts. We do. We surround ourselves by a lot of experts. There's uh, advisory boards. We've got scientists that know what the startups are, are talking about. And, and so it's important also to have a good advisory board that can vet and ask the hard questions and especially more technical questions when you're looking at um, n you know, new molecular structures. And you know, we're talking about <laughs> nanocellulose and growing that in a lab. Absolutely. So um, we, we do surround ourselves by good, good advice. Yeah. Yeah. And which kind of advice would you give to someone that is fronting, you know, a new generation of material and is looking for funding? You know, what are you going um, to suggest Well, I think, I think a really nice way if you're a young startup and, you know, they apply to um, some startup accelerators. We run one ourselves. Uh, we run one in Hong Kong and we run one in London. There's Fashion for Good in Amsterdam. There, there's a lot of them. Um, honestly, there's, that's, that's not an issue. And I think it's a really great way to get inside the network of getting to know VCs. And you know, if you're um, a startup, you're looking to develop potentially a product or a service. And typically, these startup accelerators give you a good framework to, to accelerate that. Um, and being surrounded by other startups, I think, helps uh, rather than just kind of doing it by yourself. Absolutely. I think the new business model is looking again at partnership more than individual gain. I think sustainability and innovation has to be about collaboration and partnerships. We can't just close our doors and keep our secrets and be exclusive. You know, I think this is the That's one so thing important. that, unfortunately, you know, I think fashion has been very heavy on the exclusivity aspect. Sustainability is not about that. We need to be more collaborative. No. There are ways to be exclusive, you know, and sharing <laughs> That's right. <laughs> at the That's same right. time, I think, because we want the creativity to come for sure. But creativity is another, you know, is another matter. So last but not least, can you share with us some of your, you know, case histories, you know, and a little bit the story behind it? Some of the startups that we've yes, invested in? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... I think a really interesting one actually is uh, a startup that we invested in when they were coming out of uh, Central St. Martins as a student. Uh, so we have an award that we support at, C at CSM um, specifically for the future materials course. Um, and every year we choose a student, um, give them a residency in our uh, startup incubator. So they get to spend time with prototyping machines, but at the same time, we organize visits and tours to manufacturers to really get them to go inside of the industry and meet as many people as possible. From um, when we did that three years ago, um, the person in, um, I'm, I'm speaking about has gone off and worked with uh, big companies like Lensing, and she actually worked for Bolt Threads as well. And now is back in London and is creating her own um, startup called Modern Synthesis. They're growing um, shoes in a lab made out of cellulose. 
Um, it, it, it's really fantastic to see that. Um, and so she approached us, we were delighted, and we incubated Modern Synthesis. So right now we're helping them to find a partner, and they're looking for partners in footwear, they're looking for partners that can develop a handbag, um, which is currently their, their focus. But it's, it's quite important to be able to invest in young startups, even if the ideas sound crazy. Um, I think where, where there's passion, there's a way. Um, so that's, I think, a good example of, of, of how, what we can do to be more responsible in terms of financing, or at least supporting the startups. And, and you're just saying that finance is really important because without that, but it's also the responsibility is uh, really to look for someone uh, that uh, you know is also helping you in delivering your project from the expertise of having close to you some companies, uh, some possible partners. So it's really 360 degrees. Absolutely. I think it's collaboration, 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 collaboration. Even if it's just with the third party or the manufacturer or the school or the designers, uh, that's what we need to do. And I think so any startup that's out there, they should just have as many conversations as possible, go through as many startup accelerators as possible, yeah. and, um, and network and, and ask questions and yeah, challenge. That's, that's the mantra, you know, you know yeah. to, to dare and to ask questions and then uh, to, to develop together with expertise all together. So thank you very much, Christian. And uh, Mark Herrema. Hi, Mark. Can you unmute? Yes. <laughs> ah, okay, good. <laughs> now it's better. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, so, Mark Arema, co-founder and CEO of New Like Technologies. So, in 2003, you co-founded the, you know, New Light with a vision of using greenhouse gases as a resource to make high-performance sustainable materials. After a decade of research, Mark and his team developed a technology that uses a natural process found in the ocean right to convert uh, greenhouse gas into a material called air carbon so can you talk a little bit to us uh, mark about uh, new lights and air carbon and how you know responsible finance is so important you know in the process of developing and communicating and making you know this change that we need in our system to go to the next uh, step yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, you know, finances is one of the most critical parts of, of the journey. Um, I've got a, a, a slide deck that I'm going to pull up on screen just to, oh, can't share. If, uh, if that can be enabled, let me know. I'll just talk through it otherwise. Um, so we, we started with this question of, can we use carbon that would otherwise go into the air as a feedstock, as a resource to make products? And the idea was we wanted to put um, a, a tool to drive carbon out of the air into people's hands. A lot of times when we look at climate change, it's this very broad thing and we all want to do something about it, but there, there are very few outlets for it. And so we said, what if we could come up with a consumer driven pathway to addressing climate change? And for us, that meant trying to turn greenhouse gas into useful products. Um, so early on, we were uh, just doing, you know, paper studies out of out of our university dorm rooms. Um, and we discovered that there are microorganisms in the ocean, natural microorganisms that eat greenhouse gas as their food source. And when they do that, one of the things that, that happens is they produce this molecule inside of their cells. And this molecule is called PHB. Um, PHB is a really fascinating thing. Most people don't know about it, but we're all making it right now. So every human being makes makes PHB. In fact, most living things make, make PHB. Um, what's equally fascinating is that when you extract it and isolate it, it's meltable. And so all of a sudden now you have a naturally occurring material that can be melted, which means it can replace a whole range of products, um, specifically plastic, but also things like acetate and leather. Um, and so early on, we sort of said, we've got this really interesting platform concept where we could turn greenhouse gas naturally into this naturally occurring material, PHB, we call it air carbon. Um, and uh, by virtue of using greenhouse gas as an input and using a renewable source of power in the same way that it's carbon negative when it uh, is produced in nature, we also potentially could create a carbon negative biomaterial. And so the idea seemed really interesting, um, but 
uh, it took a long time to figure out how to how to do that. Um, and so the, the journey from concept to our first commercial scale output was about 10 years. Um, and so from a finance perspective, that was also, you know, a really important part of the journey. You know, after we had spent about a year and a half in, in, in a laboratory, we raised our first round of pilot capital. Um, I remember our first check for twelve thousand five hundred dollars. Um, uh, and eventually in that round, I believe we raised about one point eight million. Um, we used that to build a pilot plant and then we kept progressively making advances in the technology um, and raising additional capital, adding more team members. Um, but it was still it was still a long road that that first 10 years, I think after 10 years, we had um, uh, maybe around 10, 15 people. Uh, today we're 135, wow. um, and a lot of that growth has happened just in the past few years. So, the, so the first decade was just a lot of tech development. W what I've seen is that um, finance—it it all comes down to risk, and so there's this risk reward ratio. And people, a lot of people, want to invest in sustainability. The job, I think, one of the jobs of the uh, the teams driving those technologies, those sustainable technologies. Is, is to really look at risk management. And um, obviously, you know, to Christian's point, uh, passion is critical. You've got, you've got to find teams that they're, they're not gonna stop. They're, they're, they're going to find a way no matter what. Um, that was part of our DNA. And I, and I think our, our shareholders along the way have, have seen that. Um, uh, but, but it's also the job of the technologist to, to show, to give proof points for Hey, look, we're yeah. demonstrating that we can do it at this scale, bigger scale. We're showing these different performance features. Um, and so over time, we just kept getting bigger and bigger, demonstrating more and more capabilities. Um, and last year, we brought online our first fully integrated large commercial scale plant. Um, and so that was roughly an 18 year journey. And wow. today we've got this beautiful manufacturing facility. We're flowing foodware to the market. We're flowing carbon negative uh, leather replacements. Um, we're using blockchain technology to track all of the, the carbon footprints for our products. Um, you, can, you can buy one of our uh, air carbon wallets and there's a blockchain number on there and you can track you know, everything that's going on there and the third party validation for the carbon footprint. All this very cool stuff. None of that happens without, without the finance component. So um, it's really sort of a step-by-step function of risk management and and then getting progressive you know more financing and then just building step by step yeah and one question you know 18 years old the journey so it's it's a life how do you think the finance has, the world of finance and responsible finance in particular has changed from that time to today so someone that is starting today you know and we will go to Iris as well later because uh, she's in the middle <laughs> of something really interesting as well. How did it change? Uh, you know, wh which are the suggestions, you know, for someone like you that has been through this, uh, you know, what, what can you suggest? Um, I think Christian had a really good point on, on collaborations. We actually were not good at that for the first 10 years. We were in stealth mode. I mean, we, we didn't really collaborate with, with anyone. Um, and I think the, it's a good point to make that the more you collaborate, the more you, you, you can learn and sort of shortcut um, learnings that would otherwise take a long time. I think that look, there, is, there has been a massive change in the 18 years that I've been doing this. I'd say the past five and then really quickly over the past five, we've seen an uptick in ESG um, emphasis like nothing that we've ever seen before. And so that that's a function of the I believe the investment community has recognized that there is broad scale demand on the consumer side for sustainable products. And so corporations are responding to that and the investment community is responding to that. I think one thing that's important for new entrants is to be really clear about what the value proposition is. The more quantifiable you can make it, um, I think that's really helpful. Broad based is fine. There's nothing wrong with wanting to change things in a big general way. Um, but the more specific you can make your impact, it helps the investment community understand where things are going. And absolutely. And we keep saying that we need to focus. You know, there is nothing generic. And generic is good for people that will not 
and at the end will not change anything because it's not possible in a generic way. You need to understand where you want to go and how you want to make your personal, you know, footprint and uh, you know, uh, action plan as well. So, uh, last but not least, uh, what is your next uh, steps as uh, Air Carbon and New Light? It's growth. Um, you know, we now have our, our commercial plant online. We kind of considered our solar panel. In other words, as we go forward now, we're just adding more of these plants. So that was a major inflection point for us from a de-risking standpoint. You know, we're now selling in almost 2000 locations across the US. Um, and so we're just focused on now growth and, and having been in tech development for so long and demonstrations and so forth, it's a tremendously exciting moment for us. Um, and so we're now looking to build our next global scale manufacturing facility. Um, and that's something that we're working hard on. Uh, you know, we want to we want to see major change. We didn't we didn't start this company to be an interesting, you know, niche sort of thing. We, like everybody here, we want to see real true change. Um, and it's nice to finally be able to start delivering to our eager customers. Everybody within the ecosystem wants to do something whether it's a corporation and fashion company, what, but the, the challenge is often the, the availability of the solution. Um, so it's really exciting for us right now to finally start to be able to deliver. And now we would just want to do that in a bigger and bigger way. And you think that responsible finance is available. It's not just something that we see on the magazine from time to time. <laughs> no, I think it's, I think it's a real thing. We, we see significant demand uh, for, for our platform in that community. Um, I think it, there has been a real, a real shift. Thank you, Mark, and uh, welcome, Dio. Hey. So, Thank you. Dio Kurazawa, co-founder of the Beer Scouts, a friend, but at the same time, you know, he's at the forefront, like us, at the war <laughs> against waste <laughs> in the fashion oh. business. That's sometimes how we call ourselves. But it's uh, a deep, uh, uh, yes, deep knowledge about the supply chain at global level about the current system. So we are not anymore into the future, you know, and how to drive starting talking about sustainability. We need to look at what we have and try to change it, right, Dio? And we have right. been, uh, you know, talking about how, how finance can help something that is already existing, something that is doing a lot of announcement in terms of changes as well. So can you share with us your point of view? Uh, Dio, and uh, what's happening and what should happening and where responsible finance is coming inside. Uh, thanks, Juicy. Thanks very much for inviting me. Um, essentially, as you know, we worked with the Bear Scouts trying to piece together collaborations between brands, retailers, and most importantly, supply chain and innovative supply chain members um, from all directions, from direct to consumer shipping from factories to blockchain and metaverse NFT solutions. Um, uh, you name it. I mean, literally, we're playing in very innovative um, spectrum. But what we find is that as innovative as we can offer brands and retailer solutions, often we're still stuck at the place of does this new innovation truly replace the traditional? Um, that being said, often we run into roadblocks with, you know, the cost of these these new items. And then we consider the the whole idea of incentives. So what incentivizes fast fashion, in fact? If we look at the fact that fast fashion is able to continue, it's not just because, you know, I hear often, and I just heard uh, not so long ago, that um, the, the youth or Gen Z and, 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 and new consumers are ready for responsible fashion. But I honestly think that these, you know, uh, polls that are, are given out is like asking someone on the street, do you care about the environment? I think the first answer would be yes. So I'm not really sure, and I'm not, and I'll be honest, no one in the company really believes that consumer behavior is going to shift. What we do believe is that you need to incentivize the supply chain, uh, the brands, uh, as well as the retailers to do something in the, in the, in the right way. Um, as I said, fast fashion is incentivized by the fact that responsible fashion is a privilege. Uh, if you think about emerging markets like you know, India or China, I mean, they're experiencing wealth for the first time in their life or disposable income for the first time in their life. So is it fair for us as, uh, you know, the Western world to tell them not to follow what we've done? It's very difficult. So what incentivizes them? And I think finance has an opportunity here. So if I'm working with a retailer, I'm looking at what they're looking for and how, what, you know, what ticks their boxes as far as an incentive is concerned. 
We also look at the supply chain. Of course, you know, we're always putting a lot of pressure on suppliers to try and do more. Um, but there's never, you know, an idea of giving them more to do more. Um, so what we've been doing lately is increasing the or decreasing the inequality gap between the supplier and the brands. And how we do that is a gross profit margin share between the brands and the supplier, where, whereby the supplier for the first time has an, in, uh, an investment in a way uh, in the brand and the brand shares a agreed upon percentage with the supply chain of the gross profit margin. This is essentially uh, the ability for the supplier to invest or reinvest into his supply chain or to his business um, and maybe invest into new innovations that the brand has been requesting or asking for, um, maybe to pay a living wage, uh, you know, basic things in, in reality. But this is something that should, in my opinion, <laughs> should have existed long ago. Well, for sure, we are, I think, highlighting another part that, you know, it's, it, it's called laws and governments, I think. <laughs> because <laughs> <Or> we are, <laughs> okay, and for sure, this is something that is going to come because where the money is going at a certain point, things are going to change. But uh, which are the, the kind of uh, suggestion that you could, you know, give us uh, today in order also from basic perspective you know about people that are already operating because we know that the world is changing we know the consumer is not so informed uh, dio and uh, and it's not his fault uh, 90 percent of the time no it's not that i don't really fault the compute the, the consumer i mean we're living in a capitalist society where obviously the rewards are given to those who you know promote uh, business or big business. And, you know, we all kind of follow those things from a end perspective. So I don't fault the consumer and I actually don't fault anyone. I'm a very forgiving person, but I know that we've run out of time. So what I'm looking for are solutions for everyone to have an incentive to eat off from, to continue to feed our families, but at the same time, not to have a negative impact on our environment. So, you know, we started this whole, what we call in-kind investment, whereby there's a gross profit margin share between brands and the supply chain in order to ensure that both parties have an intrinsic interest for success. Yeah. And in, in reality, what this really basically means is that if you're a brand, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm one of the, I'm really fortunate to work with Ghani as one of their uh, sustainable board members. And I can say that Ghani is a company in transition. They are looking at every aspect of their business and how it affects the, you know, the carbon emissions. I think if you're looking at a company like Ghani, for example, where, you know, they're looking to say, when we make a profit, we want our supply chain to make a profit as well. No longer just paying for cost of goods sold, but looking at, you know, how can we increase um, the visibility of what we're doing, number one, um, so to, to really embrace transparency. Uh, I, I heard someone mention before that we should be mimicking the food industry. I always talk about this with a company called Fujicate. Fujicate is an app that enables you to scan products um, in the grocery store and it gives you an A, B, C, D or E rating or F rating. Um, and, and as I said, companies like Ghani are really, you know, trying to ensure that every step that they're taking is considering, you know, carbon neutral, not carbon neutral, let's say, uh, you know, carbon emissions. I think if you can consider an in-kind investment with your supplier, whether it's a new technology or whatever it is, it will enable them to go further. I mean, financially, <laughs> that's, a, that's a big difference that we're, you know, they're giving income beyond just the uh, cost of goods or, or the products and services being paid for. They're being actually incentivized for doing a great job in, in reality. And the brand is incentivizing them through the sharing of the gross profits. But at the same time, the brand is getting, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, selling a responsible product that doesn't have a negative impact on the environment very well. I hope that explains it well. I don't know if I've answered your question properly. Well, well, I think yes. You know, we are, <clears throat> you know, evaluating. We are looking at all the the kind of possibility and solution. And for sure, one does not exclude the other because we are talking about uh, sharing the innovation, but the human centric <laughs> part, uh, you know, of respect uh, or environment respect uh, has to be there. So we cannot right. just do innovation that innovate, but the responsibility and the fact that you need to create the impact. And I think what the finance is saying uh, in the last at least five years, starting from Davos, is uh, we are not going to put anything in order not to run risk, because it's a risk today not to fulfill 
the human, you know, uh, let's say rights and the healthiness, uh, you know, that's part of the, you know, the ESG and the fact that you are part of a business strategy and not an additional value from time to time that is telling right. the story. Of course, one thing is to start from, you know, uh, the beginning with new innovation where it's already there. Another thing is to change what we have and that's where sometimes uh, we are struggling. But thank you, Dio. And, uh, of course, thank you. And Iris. Iris is the ciao. Iris is the co-founder and CEO of Orinun, which she founded in 2020 after experiencing the impact of fashion, technology, and sustainability within global brands such as Nike and, and Calvin Klein. Renun, and for me this is really important, is the first app globally to match consumer with fashion according to sustainability values. We talk about consumer, but sometimes consumer has not a clue on how and where to buy sustainable goods. So Iris, can you share with us uh, a little bit Renun and you know, the important part of uh, responsible uh, finance for your journey? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I mean, also great introduction into what Renewin does. And um, again, also very, in a way, proud that we're the, the first um, global platform. But also, um, I was very surprised, actually, that when I realized uh, two years ago, when I first had experienced myself as a consumer, this problem, that a, a platform like that wasn't already there. Um, so. Basically, the, our journey uh, really started indeed as myself, like coming from the fashion industry, um, seeing the impact that it had, but also like personally as a consumer, um, touching like and seeing as consumers, there's no tool to educate yourself, first of all, understand what, uh, how, what, what can you do in order to um, be part of this tr sustainability transformation uh, coming intrinsically from, from you as a consumer. Um, and secondly, the, the way uh, fashion is consumed right now, uh, and it's made uh, consumable by um, the rest of the market, it's very easy and convenient. And that's not the case when it comes to uh, making the right choice. Um, so indeed, two years ago, I was looking for a black dress, a uh, very simple task. I wanted it to be sustainable, and I spent two months looking for it. And that's what really also um, made the sparkle for Renewn. Um, so in February last year, 2020, we uh, started the company uh, with other three co-founders. And uh, after prototyping, understanding, and uh, going through a whole process um, that made us connect with a lot of people, indeed, within the industry, Juzi, a uh, part of it, um, we, uh, we gathered uh, business angels. And um, also, we have, uh, uh, now we're actually announcing soon, um, a VC from the US uh, that is joining uh, our first pre-seed round. And so uh, our tool, what it enables, it enables consumers to be part of this transformation, um, to, uh, to really have in one place uh, the choices and the possibilities that they can have. Uh, and in that way, um, we have this double-sided mission to um, help the consumers, but in the end also bring them together with what is the offering and the brands that are doing out there um, and really help also the brands uh, make the, uh, help the consumers make the best choices. Absolutely. And that's why my next question is about, um, you know, it was difficult for you to, and it's still difficult for you as a renowned, uh, you know, responsible finance to help you and support you in your journey. And how much you feel responsible then to drive the change toward the consumer because, uh, you know, what you are doing is going really to shift uh, uh, the way the knowledge and the information that the consumer is looking for because we have never to forget that in market research, consumer is looking for beautiful but sustainable, responsible things. And uh, sometimes it's difficult and you will allow it. How do you think, uh, you know, responsible finance will help driving these two changes at this point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so on, in one way, um, as a platform, because indeed we're known as a platform, we're, we're not a shopping app in the way that we redirect users to where they can um, purchase the items. We have an algorithm that goes inside of the, uh, not only at the brand, but also at the product level. Um, to look at uh, their composition and the materials that they're using. Um, and we hope to also then 
shift in this way uh, for and introduce to users uh, new materials, uh, innovative materials, and help help this transition happen faster. Um, so in that direction, um, what we're seeing is that as a platform that aggregates all these different uh, things, and not only just brands and materials and um, it, I mean products and brands that use those materials and but also the circular economy point of view. So in that circular economy point of view, for example, we're introducing and experimenting with users, uh, rental and secondhand. And we all know, as, as Christian was also saying at the beginning, that this is like where the future is going. Um, and we just don't know exactly um, what, what, which one of these solutions are gonna be picked up by the market. Um, and also not only the market, but what also solution is going to be the right one in terms of sustainability um, because there's also still some question marks when it comes to some um, alternative business models to whether they're going to work both from consumers perspective but also sustainability perspective um, so in that perspective we feel like we're in a very um, uh, yeah a very very interesting position um, and and then in that case uh, responsible finance to us means having that fuel also from VCs. I mean, we are anyways a tech a platform company. Um, and uh, in that in that case, uh, I think also what Christian was saying before, I think we went through um, a pretty um, normal path when it comes to startups. We did uh, our first like uh, accelerator. Uh, we're doing a second one uh, in the US. Um, and uh, yeah, with a, we're, we have a, a VC back uh, right now and so, we also notice actually that in a really good way, like seeing the difference also between just last year, uh, we've been receiving a lot of inbound uh, requests from VCs uh, because everyone is, yeah, sees that this is the future and they, wanna, um, they want to get in. So that's, I think, um, the most positive thing that we've been seeing right now. So things are really moving fast so. and recognizing yeah. and informing about what is going on, uh, you know, with the, with, with the good the companies that are doing something that can really help to change and transition, as you said, Iris. So thank you, Iris. I will open up uh, if there are some questions, also because we are getting into tight times as well, you know, but uh, please, uh, if someone want to, any, Matteo, <laughs> ciao. Okay, so it's fine, so thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, Dio, and Iris. And uh, keep in touch because we will be back soon anyhow because we, we know that these are just processes that are ongoing and we would like to come back and see how things are moving. Thanks a lot. Have a good day for someone. Have a good evening. Thank you, Christian, to thank be you. here Grazie. in Milan. Grazie. Thank, you. thank you for your time. Very thanks. Well. And thanks to Lina Pelle. Thanks to Linea Pelle for coordinating this information moment, really. Thanks. Thank you.